to good morning and thanks for being here this important day. I'm Robert Mock, Vice President for Student Affairs and co-chair of the Provost Search Committee. The Provost serves as an advocate and resource for all of the University of Kentucky as Chief Academic Officer. The Provost oversees and guides the academic programs of the institution and leads in the promotion and development of a set of academic priorities that will accomplish with the highest possible quality. Making those priorities a reality involves cultivating strong and long-lasting partnerships with the campus community and fostering a, a culture of continuous improvement, trust, collaboration, diversity, and inclusion. As such, the Provost's office is a resource for colleges, deans, students, faculty, and staff at the University of Kentucky. I would like to, take, to thank the other members of this uh, search committee for their efforts. After a thorough review and feedback from across the University of Kentucky campus, the committee has recommended two outstanding qualified candidates for the position. In a moment, we will ask each candidate pr to provide brief opening comments in which he will address the following how his background has prepared him for this important position, how he believes with his, how he believes with his leadership will continue our momentum and make progress in the important areas of student success, graduation, education, and research. His thoughts on steps we can take together to create a more inclusive and equitable campus community and environment. Afterward, you will be given the opportunity to write down any questions you have. There are no cards provided for you and you can raise your hand when you have written a question and someone will come to collect your card and bring it to me. For those of you watching the forum via live stream, you can submit your questions via email to provostsearch at uky.edu or tweet your questions to at ukyprovost. The forums will be archived and available for review this afternoon on UK Now. After the form is complete, you can you also can provide email feedback, and you can email this to the address provostsearch at uky.edu. We will continue to take feedback until the close of business today. Your feedback is important and will be utilized by President Capilouto in his deliberations regarding this important position over the next few days. Now, let me introduce to you Dean Tim Tracy. Tim Tracy received his bachelor's degree in pharmacy from Ohio Northern University. His PhD in clinical pharmacy from Purdue University and completed a postdoctoral fellowship in clinical pharmacology at Indiana University. Prior to entering academia, he practiced, his community, he practiced in the community and hospital settings throughout Ohio. He launched his academic career at West Virginia University where he rose through the ranks to full professor. During his time at West Virginia University, he won six college-wide teaching awards and one university-wide teaching award. Dr. Tracy then joined the University of Minnesota, where he served as head of the Department of Experimental, Experimental and Clinical Pharmacology, director for the Center for Forecasting, Drug Response, and director of Clinical and Translational Research Services. In August of 2010, he joined the University of Kentucky as the Dean of the College of Pharmacy and from May of 2012 until August of 2013, also served as the interim provost. In addition, Dr. Tracy currently serves as associate director for the Center for Clinical and Translational Science with responsibilities for the Clinical Service Corps, regulatory support function, and the drug discovery and development function. His research and teaching interests deal with pharmacogenetics and their effect on metabolism of drugs, and was well as the large field of clinical pharmacology. Dr. Tracy has published almost 100 scientific manuscripts, more than 15 book chapters, and edited two books, and has served as a principal and co-investigator on numerous NIH funded grants. I give you Dr. Tim Tracy. First, I'd like to thank all of you for braving this cold morning, and uh, certainly at this early hour. Thanks for coming out, and for those of you that are watching online, uh, thank you as well. This is an exciting time at the University of Kentucky, with unparalleled momentum created by the leadership of President Capilouto. 
Thus, I am extremely honored to be a candidate for the position of provost. I believe my administrative experience as a center director and co-director, department head, dean, and as interim provost has given me the depth and breadth of administrative experiences necessary to work collaboratively with faculty and staff, students, the deans, senior UK leaders, and the president to help the university continue our ascent. During my 15 months as interim provost, my colleagues and I conducted a reorganization of the office to develop a greater service focus and to enhance efficiency and effectiveness to better serve the academy, the colleges, and students. This was coupled with a focus on initiatives to increase student success. For example, the significant expansion of the living learning communities. It is gratifying to see these programs continue to expand and reach even more students. More recently, I was grateful to be asked to participate with the Undergraduate Dean's Council in developing the Student Success Plan, and I believe strongly in its goals and initiatives. Our university research enterprise must continue to grow. Being an NIH-funded investigator, I can appreciate the effort and infrastructure necessary to compete in this challenging funding environment. Having served as Director of Clinical and Translational Research Services at the University of Minnesota, and as an associate director of our Center for Clinical and Translational Sciences here at UK. I also understand the efforts required to obtain and renew the Clinical and Translational Science Award grant that is so critical to our research infrastructure. In strengthening our graduate and professional education efforts, we must help our students prepare to continuously develop in their careers and to adapt to the changing marketplace needs. For example, for the professional program in our college, we are in the process of a complete curricular revision, utilizing new pedagogical methods with expectations of increased personal accountability for learning and the goal of helping students learn how to learn and learn how to apply over their career lifetime. Likewise, we are re-envisioning the graduate program and just this week held a graduate faculty retreat to begin planning for a new graduate education paradigm. As Dean of Pharmacy, I led a process to develop and to develop strategy and execute well-defined strategic initiatives to advance the college. This planning focused on creating differentiation and distinction to enable us to maintain and even improve our number five national ranking. This planning produced the initiative to carry out the curricular revision I just spoke of. Also a 30% increase in research funding over the past five years with the goal of another 30% increase for the next five and plans for developing new patient care delivery models to meet the needs of the citizens of the Commonwealth. A particularly important product of this strategic planning for differentiation and distinction was and continues to be our commitment to increase the diversity and inclusivity of our student body as well as of our faculty and staff. Our planning explicitly recognized that increased diversity strengthens our community by enriching the experiences of all our students and the different perspectives that result from it serve to further differentiate our program. Over the past five years of our plan, our percentage of students of ethnicity has more than doubled, increasing from 8% to 19%. Through these conscious efforts, we have also nearly tripled the geographic diversity of our class from 10% non-resident in 2010 to almost 28% today. With respect to our faculty and staff diversity, half of the college leadership team, 80% of the dean's senior staff, and one third of our faculty are now women. While we still have much room for improvement in the strategic plan being developed now, we are building on a solid base to develop additional in initiatives to further increase our college's diversity and inclusivity. Now I'd like to take a few moments to address the three specific areas the president mentioned for discussion at this forum. First, student success. The Undergraduate Dean's Council, through intense collaborative effort, has created an excellent template for addressing the issue of student success. As their report suggests, the proper expectations must be set before beginning classes, an academic culture reinforced, and assessment processes utilized to assure students are placed in the proper classes based on their major and readiness. Advising should be integrated and coordinated across the campus. 
with students receiving consistent messaging and the advising handoffs during major switches made seamless. A clear pathway to graduation in four years must be assured through elimination of bottlenecks and assurances of class availability when they are needed. Engagement programming enhances student success and must occur in the classroom, but also through co-curricular and extracurricular activities. And the right balance between merit-based and need-based aid must be struck so that we minimize unmet financial need. All this and additional initiatives outlined in the report will require teamwork and collaboration among the deans, student affairs, enrollment management, undergraduate education, student leadership, and the provost to carry out this work. Some of these initiatives will require resources, and I'm committed to working with the deans to not only realign our resources, but also identify new resources. I believe that through this team effort, we can achieve our goal of increasing first to second year retention by at least five percentage points in five years. This would mean that each year we would be enabling an additional 250 freshmen to return to UK for their sophomore year. Research and graduate education. Enhancement of our research and creative scholarship efforts is important to our land grant mission and also to our, to our position as the Commonwealth's indispensable research university. For the sciences, infrastructure like the research space in the new academic science building and the proposed UK research building are critical. In parallel, we must also determine areas of strategic focus that are most important to Kentuckians and make key investments in faculty and infrastructure to make rapid and significant progress in these strategic areas. This will require a partnership between the Vice President for Research and the Provost working with the colleges to truly advance the research enterprise. In addition, we must also make efforts to enhance the support for creative scholarship and those areas that don't lend themselves to traditional extramural funding. The creative arts, the humanities, and other disciplines are also vital to our generation of new knowledge and experiences. Clearly, these disciplines must be included in the conversations and a full understanding of their needs appreciated. We must thoughtfully examine and re-envision graduate education, particularly in light of funding pressures on the support of graduate students. Critical questions must be asked and answered. For example, are we missing opportunities in new areas where we have developing expertise and for which new professional opportunities exist? While maintaining a strong knowledge foundation, can we enhance the students' breadth of knowledge and experiences as well as soft skills, characteristics that employers are increasingly expecting. A deep dive into these issues involving internal and external stakeholders will be critical to answering these questions and assuring the vitality of our graduate education efforts. And finally, creating a more inclusive and equitable campus community and environment. The team preparing this section of the UK strategic plan did much great work and from these efforts, there is much to build upon. I look forward to gaining more insight from the committee on their deliberations and their findings and working with the president to achieve these goals. Certainly, we must provide our students, faculty, and staff with the broadest range of experiences, the most welcoming environment to live, learn, and work, and the opportunity to learn from others with a wide range of backgrounds and views. Multiple strategies must be employed to increase the diversity, inclusivity, and equity of our campus community. We need to assure a safe environment for ongoing campus community-wide dialogue about inclusivity and equitability. Scholarship opportunities for students of diversity must be enhanced at the undergraduate level, and these must be coupled with enhanced recruiting efforts. With respect to increasing faculty diversity, at previous institutions where I have served, we have successfully utilized programs to help support the transition of graduate students and postdoctoral fellows of underrepresented groups into faculty positions through bridging money to help support the completion of their training and the initiation of their faculty appointment. Relatedly, we have utilized programs that involve a partnership between the provost's office and colleges to help support a substantial portion of the first three years of employment of candidates from underrepresented groups. 
These are just a few examples of efforts that can be taken to increase diversity and create a more inclusive and equitable campus environment. In summary, President Capilouto has presented a clear and compelling vision for the work of the provost, focusing on student success, research, graduate and professional education, strategic planning, diversity and inclusivity, and the implementation of a financial model. These priorities will be best accomplished through partnerships and collaboration among faculty and staff, the deans and department chairs, students, the provost, and the president. We must all work hand in hand to achieve these important goals. It is an exciting time at the, of transformation at the University of Kentucky, and I would consider it an honor to serve as a member of the president's leadership team to move these initiatives forward and help the university build on its momentum to achieve even greater success. Thank you. The first question we have is UK's average ACT scores are the highest in the state but lower than regional flagships. Should our average ACT score for incoming freshmen be, high, freshmen be higher, and if so, how high should it be? How high is a, is a, a, a difficult question. The question is, is that the only method or only measure of preparedness? It's one measure, and it's certainly something that's very objective that you can, uh, can count numbers uh, pretty easily. Uh, we are, in fact, pretty close to several peer institutions. Uh, in the SEC, for instance, in the average SAT score or ACT score of our students. As far as regionals, I'll admit that I don't know those numbers quite as well. We always strive to have the highest ACT scores possible. But the question is, are you also looking at access and making sure that we have access for our university, and is that the only measure? I support a holistic view of admissions, so you look at many aspects, not just scores and grades, but also experiences. I think you have to take all those into account when you're considering admissions criteria. The next question. Please explain your thoughts on the importance of undergraduate transfer students on our campus. What specific ideas do you have to increase the success of these transfer students? Undergraduate transfer students are an important part of our campus and, and represent a, a meaningful number of uh, individuals. But we have to remember that they have unique experiences and background, and we've got to have that environment ready for them when they get here. One of the things, if you look at the literature, is that transfer students frequently don't feel included as part of the campus community as readily because they haven't started with that class. So we need to double our efforts to make sure that they become included and part of the campus community, that they get engaged, and that they are inculcated into our, our campus because it's a significant issue coming in from another university and not starting. So we have to make sure that we have programming built around that so that those individuals come in and can better uh, join our campus and our campus community. Next question. While we all appreciate the need to deliver quality outcomes and document these, it seems as if the faculty and administration are being required to deliver an ever increasing number of assessment reports. Many of these seem somewhat redundant. How can the provost's office help to make this activity more efficient and effective so we can spend more productive time doing rather than assessing? Uh, very good question. As a dean, I, I, can, I can appreciate that question. As a dean who's going through accreditation right now, I can appreciate the, that question quite, uh, quite well. Uh, you know, one of the things that, that I find when I look at these processes, frequently we ask the same question in slightly different ways, and so we're producing essentially the da same data multiple times. One of the things the provost, I think, could do is begin to take uh, a more global view of this and say, well, is this really fundamentally the same question? And how can we ask it only once? versus faculty and administration getting that same question multiple times in slightly different forms for different uh, audiences or assessment groups or accreditation uh, bodies, whatever it might be. That's the first step I think you have to take is begin to say, what are we doing to um, add to that particular burden because we're not coordinated, we're not integrated, and so we're asking, or different people are asking the same question of the same, of one person multiple times, and that's the first step I would take to begin to address that, is, 
is try to coalesce that together and understand what the questions are, bring them together, and if I have to ask a faculty member or an administrator, try to ask it once and get all the information one time. Two of these are related, so I'm gonna sort of combine them. Two or three years ago, the university started to work on a new budget model, which stalled. It had goals of, it started with transparency and had more control at the college level. Today, I hear a great deal of uncertainty about the future budget direction and absence of transparency. What are your ideas for steps to take to resolve uncertainty and achieve the goals of transparency? And for full disclosure, I was uh, one of the individuals involved in developing the initial versions of the budget model. Started that in January of 2012, if I remember my dates correctly. Um, We've certainly gone through a lot of things, and I, I have not been involved in that process for about a year and a half, so I'd need to take a little bit of time and learn what's there. But given this, the current environment and where we're at right now, I would advocate that we start with a simpler model, uh, a fully transparent model, but a simpler model that has just a few buckets, if I can use the term buckets, of uh, monies that really incentivize colleges to do the two or three key things that we want to accomplish right now. Find a way to, to sort of simplify that down and align the incentives for the colleges with the things like student success, retention, and graduation, uh, some research efforts, so we align those. The colleges have very clear goals and they're not trying to manage quite so much. We would still need to make sure that we don't give all the money out uh, because we need some money for strategic initiatives. For instance, the Student Success Initiative is probably going to take some significant resources besides what's in the colleges. And so the provost and president would need to have some money to be able to do that as well, but to fuel that so it becomes campus-wide and truly integrated and coordinated. The next one is a statement, so therefore we would ask for you to comment on it. Parking for commuting students is inadequate Shuttle services to parking lots should run longer for evening classes and events so students do not walk in the dark. Uh, yes, uh, now the answer. Uh, and in fact, I had to deal with this a bit in, in my own college because with Commonwealth uh, Stadium construction, it's also impacted us. And um, my role as dean was to advocate for the students to try to get them access to different parking lots and uh, different shuttle services for that. So one of the roles of the provost is to try to learn what some of those student issues are and serve as an advocate for that. Obviously, I work very would work very closely and did when I was interim provost with the EBPFA, or the Executive Vice President for Finance and Administration, Eric Mundy, who is the parking falls under his, his office, to begin to, to, to see that we understand the issues, what are the possibilities, and try to make sure that we have that uh, both convenient and safe campus environment. How do you envision addressing the classroom shortage enhanced by increasing the size of the incoming class and the loss of the student center during construction? It's gonna be a very difficult balancing act. Uh, it's gonna be a balancing act, but uh, we've, we've got to take efforts to look and see if we are using, utilizing classrooms correctly. When I was in the interim provost role, we did analysis of classrooms and which ones were adequate, were the right size for the right classes. And sometimes we had 100 or 200 person lecture halls for 50 students. Sometimes we had then overflow in other rooms. And so part of the, part of the issue is going through and making sure that we size the classrooms correctly for the classes that are meeting in them. That's one step, not the universal answer. But one step, because there are some inefficiencies. Sometimes we have scheduled classes classrooms for convenience uh, for us, and sometimes that creates then difficulties down the road and their downstream effects. The other issue that I ran into was classes that met at, uh, can we call it non-standard times. And so if you meet at non-standard times, you're now taking up the classroom for two hours instead of one hour. And so they were start, starting at some odd times. Likewise, a class that only meets once a week is there a way that we can better organize those so that it doesn't take up that classroom space across that hour the entire week? So a number of, of immediate strategies that you can take to begin to look at the most efficient use of the resources. But the second question then is, is to say, 
to do that balancing of students that we admit, resources that we have, and that requires conversations between the EVPFA, the, the provost, and all those individuals to make sure that that's part of our, um, our decision-making process. Next question. Can you look into your crystal ball and elaborate on how you will prepare UK for the academic programs 20 years into the future? Wow. Easy question. Uh, crystal ball. I have a cloudy crystal ball. So my crystal ball is not clear. It's pretty cloudy. cloudy. But I, if you look, there are a number of, uh, the world is changing very quickly. And um, what was it I saw uh, the other day, speaking of my, uh, my field, that medical literature doubles, the, the amount of medical literature doubles every five years. That's, that's pretty, pretty striking to double every five years. So how do we begin to adapt to that? Well, that goes back to part of what I was talking about earlier with learn how to learn and learn how to apply. And I think that's probably the biggest change we're going to have to produce in our students is we cannot give them all the information they need in four years to last them for the next 40. So we're going to have to find new ways to help them learn how to learn, i.e. acquire new information as they go throughout their career and learn how to apply that information to new situations. So it's going to take new pedagogical methods. It's going to take uh, different ways of looking at how we do things how we as faculty carry out our jobs and help them become learners, not just passive recipients of, uh, of our information. Uh, we may become less gatekeepers of knowledge and more translators of knowledge or facilitators of knowledge uh, in that process. So, you know, can I predict what jobs are gonna be there? No, and I won't try that. Uh, can I even predict what healthcare is gonna look like in 20? No, I won't even go near that. Uh, but I do think it's going to require much more personal accountability for learning and helping students so that they are continuous learners, not just lifelong learners, but continuous learners. How can faculty participation in university governance be strengthened? You know, if you look at governance, obviously the ultimate governing body is the Board of Trustees. They delegate certain responsibilities to the president who can then delegate responsibilities to the provost or other individuals. But we operate in shared governance. Shared governance is a consultative process where constituents and stakeholders who, who are uh, interested parties or of those particular decisions are involved in the information process. They're consulted, information is gathered, and the ideal is when you have a two-way communication going on. Uh, we have a faculty council in our college, elected by the faculty, but it's, an, it's a wonderful consultative group for me because I can come to them and give them very uh, detailed information and I can ask them to deal with sometimes very difficult issues. And they do an incredible job of providing me with ideas about those issues so that I can make a better decision. You know, ultimately, somebody has to make a decision and somebody has to be responsible for that decision. Committees can't be responsible for decisions. It has to be an individual. But you can, that consultative process is so critical and so important to making the best decision. And I can tell you from my personal experience, they've done a wonderful job of helping me understand the issues better so that hopefully I make better decisions. How will you help aspiring faculty and staff to develop and build leadership skills for future roles? Uh, we need to do the best job we can in leadership development. And I would, I would, I would indict myself and, and the academy that we, we need to make extra efforts in doing that. What I began in the college was a uh, semi-formal leadership development program. I have a syllabus and I have readings and I have uh, pieces and right now I have six faculty working with me in a leadership development program. Four of those are women, two are men. Two of those individuals we nominated for national award or national leadership programs where I'm the local mentor and they go through a national program and both were successful. I think those kinds of programs need to be in place so that we're developing the next generation of leaders. You know, I'm here at the University of Kentucky and uh, you can also read the Herald Leader and know that I'm 54 years old. Uh, that's not a HIPAA dis uh, violation because I self-disclosed. But, you know, I've probably got about 10 years of time left, and so I, my job is to help develop the next generation of leaders. That should be a key component of what I do. 
I very much enjoy working with those six individuals. It's a lot of fun. Hopefully they get something from it as well. But we have uh, about 10 to 12 items that we go through over, it's, again, it's probably close to 20 sessions and really spend time doing that. And that, that is a critical part of it. Now there are other methods you can use. That's just the one that I'm, I have particular experience with. But it should be uh, a natural and expected component. You mentioned the importance of enhancing soft skills for graduate and professional students. What is your vision for integrating such initiatives into curricular or extracurricular programs? How would you convince graduate faculty to embrace such initiatives? Um, I, I, I would wonder whether that was uh, from one of my faculty. So, uh, but because the retreat uh, that we held this week was, I would say I walked out of there more invigorated than I have in a long time from a six hour retreat. Uh, we went in and we, there was a sort of uh, straw person model that uh, the, D, the director of graduate studies, myself and a, a couple of the department chairs and a few other people had put together of a re-envisioning of what graduate education might look like in, in our college. Uh, it had foundational knowledge, which we all, I hope, would agree is important. It had a, that as one component, and each student, based on their interest, would take a type of foundational knowledge. But then every student, regardless of their discipline, would have to uh, take some, uh, gather some information or get skills, develop competencies from what we call tools. Things like informatics, statistics, other types of tools that are cross-disciplinary. And then the third thing that students would have to have experiences from were the soft skills. You know, I, I hear from employers all the time, you're, you produce these people who have this incredible depth of knowledge, but I need them to work on multiple projects. And so how can we enhance that breadth of knowledge? But also I need them to work in teams and know how to communicate. I frequently put them in charge of a, uh, a technician or someone in the laboratory who's already been there for 20 years and knows the job better than they do. How can they learn some personnel management types of skills? And so then the third area that they would receive training in and experiences in is the soft skills. And we reinforce that through starting with a course that goes the entire first year and the students have to be in cross-disciplinary teams, in our case all the way from the discovery of new drugs to measuring the outcomes, and they have to work across that on projects that they develop to answer questions together and understand the breadth and continuum of that. So that was so invigorating to me, and that's just one example of how you begin to re-envision graduate education, but also begin to introduce those soft skills as part of the training. In 2013, the Marquis Center, Cancer Center, was fortunate to become an NCI-designated cancer center. The, re the, the review team pointed out the need to not only maintain and sustain high levels of institutional support, but to continue to increase that support on an annual basis. What can the provost do to ensure institutional support for key areas like Marquee is sustainable so they can continue the important work they do? Um, a lot of that transpired while I was interim provost and, and so I was pretty familiar with that process. You know, the, the Marquee Cancer Center is a campus-wide center. Uh, it's a partnership between the provost's office the EVPHA, their Executive Vice President for Health Affairs, and the College of Medicine. And all three of those units contribute both financially and organizationally to the Markey Cancer Center. So the provost's role in that is to do a couple things. One, to make sure that the Markey Cancer Center has those linkage, linkages across all the colleges, but to serve as that partner with the Executive Vice President for Health Affairs and with the Dean of Medicine, again, as major contributors to the finances of that organization to make sure that it has what it needs to not only thrive, but to, uh, if I can selfishly say, get renewed, uh, because we wanna renew that grant because it's so critical to our university and to our healthcare enterprise, because it has other downstream effects in terms of the clinical side and what it brings to that particular uh, area, as well as our research side. So the provost has to be a partner with those other individuals to make sure that the resources are aligned, 
to achieve the goals that are set forth and that we accomplish those goals. It is clear that your career experiences give you a good view of research, graduate training, and professional training. However, what do you say to a faculty member in the Department of Philosophy who is worried about your experience and appreciation of undergraduate education? Sure. Uh, very fair question. You know, no one individual interviewing for this job will have a career in undergraduate education and a career in healthcare. Uh, that's, a, that's a pretty difficult or tall order. So uh, in my case, I happen to have come from a healthcare uh, background, a healthcare side. But I would hope that what I did in those 15 months when I was interim provost was did a lot of learning about undergraduate education and spent a lot of time there. Uh, Michael Tick and uh, the folks in the College of Fine Arts did a wonderful job of educating me about things like the music program. And so I spent a lot of time with the director of bands, uh, the Wildcat Marching Band. I learned about Stoll Field and how important it is to the Wildcat Marching Band about scholarships for that particular unit. And they've increased from a, a band of about 180 to now almost 250, 260 individuals through great leadership. Uh, when I walked through and, and spent some time with Mark Meyer, then the chairman of chemistry, and Mark Hornblue, I saw the great things they were doing for student success with recitation sections in chemistry. And they had tremendously increased the um, uh, success rate of those students. But I also got to learn the challenges they were facing in terms of physical facilities and, and the significant needs that they had. And that greatly impacted my thoughts and my interactions in the early planning stages of the academic science building. So it's spending that time learning uh, again, any individual from one or the other is going to have to spend time learning about healthcare or learning about undergraduate education, making extra efforts to do that and appreciating it. Uh, I, I, I've learned this a personal way as well. My daughter has a master's in fine arts. You know, dad may spend a lot of time in pharmacy and mom's a nurse, but uh, our children are in no healthcare field and uh, our son's an accountant. And so with, with, she has taught me so much about art, art history, uh, taken me to museums. I now understand that when I look at a painting of the, uh, the Last Supper, she can tell me what century it was painted in based on the characteristics of that painting. I thought it was just different artists. Now I have a different appreciation. So those are the kinds of experiences. That's again, that rich campus environment and making sure that you have the broadest range of experiences and views so you appreciate all those parts that come together to make a great university. Will UK ever have a vet school to add to the six healthcare colleges? Ah, the, the, uh, a very, uh, very interesting question. You know, we have a tremendously strong equine program. It's in the College of Agriculture, Food and Environment. Uh, Starting new colleges is an, is an expensive proposition, but I always say that strategy should drive budget, not budget driving strategy. So the question should become, is that part of our strategy for differentiating and adding to the distinction of the University of Kentucky? If we collectively say it is, then, then that's the way you begin to look at those. So I would say uh, anytime you talk about new programs or should programs continue, the question is, what are we trying to be? How do we plan to get there and use that strategy then to uh, drive our resource or help determine our resource decisions on our resource allocations? So the question is, what is our strategy? What is your opinion on the balance of need-based versus merit-based aid? Um, you know, as you, as you look at, uh, I've seen just a little bit of information on, on uh, students who are coming to college, but it seems like from, from the things I'm reading, uh, there are a higher percentage of students of high income and a higher percentage of students of low income and less of students in the middle. And so uh, we seem to be seeing nationally a greater trend toward unmet financial need, uh, certainly, uh, and, and that has, can have a very significant impact upon student success. So you've got to, you've got to find the balance of making sure that you attract great students, but you also have that access and you make sure that they, are, they have the environment to succeed because if they're trying to work two and three jobs, that's not a great recipe for student success. 
So I don't have the perfect formula for that, but that's where you really have to do a significant look at how our scholarships are awarded, how we begin to allocate that, and uh, you know, how to give just enough money to attract a student that you're trying to attract and optimize that for the money that you have to give to everyone. So it, it's a, um, a bit of an optimization model but it takes some really significant thought and planning to, to, to do that kind of thing. But that's how I would start walking through that. If you're selected as the next provost, will you be resigning from your role as dean? Yes. What is your vision for the role of graduate students, not just as learners, but as teachers of undergraduates? One of the best ways that I uh, learned how to teach was by, or learned my information was learning how to teach and, and teaching it. And uh, uh, I'll, I'll tell you a quick story that happened to me as a graduate student. I'll try to make it quick. Uh, I had as my teaching mentor a gentleman by the name of Dr. Nicholas Popovich, probably the greatest professor, teacher that I ever had. And students universally loved him and, and they learned tremendously from him. One day I was his, his teaching assistant helping him and we were passing out an examination in a room called Chem 200. It was the chemistry building, room 200. You all probably know those lecture halls. They have about 500 seats on the bottom and they have about 300 in the balcony up above. So we were passing the exam out so it was every other seat, that type of thing. In typical Dr. Popovich fashion, we'd gotten there very early and gotten the exam passed out. He said, Tim, I want you to see something. Okay, so he walked me to the last row and the last seat, farthest corner of the room. He said, I want you to read what's carved onto that desktop. Now, I don't know about you, but I've seen some pretty interesting things on the desktops in classrooms. Carved into that desktop said, if I had but one hour to live, I would want to spend it in Chem 200 because it would be the longest hour of my life. <laughs> And then he said to me, Tim, I want you to remember that every single time you walk into a classroom. Those are the kinds of experiences that impact you. That's what makes graduate training so wonderful. And so I think that teaching is a tremendous part of that. Even if you're not going into academia, you will have to be a teacher for the rest of your life. So it's, it's critical to graduate education. What specific steps would you take to make sure you understood the issues of undergraduates, graduate students, and faculty in colleges different from your own? And how would you involve all the deans on communications and governance? There's sort of two parts to that question. Let me make, so don't totally throw it away to make sure I got to get both parts covered. The first is how do you uh, learn about the undergraduate, graduate, and professional education components of all the various colleges? Fundamentally, that's the first question? Yes. Okay. So one of the things I did as interim provost was a lot of walking around and meeting and learning and spending time in the various colleges. And so I visited virtually every college and sat down with people. It, it, it's learning about what they do in their environment and learning the experiences they have, the successes they have, and the challenges they have. And, and going through that. So a large part of my time is gonna to have to be spent very early enhancing the, the, the experiences that I already have. And I have some of them as I, as I described, but it, it really is spending time with individuals. You know, I had a great uh, meeting yesterday with uh, a group of students. They were one of the interviewers yesterday. And what comes out of those questions was just as important as me asking them questions. I learned just as much from their questions because it really told me what the issues are because the things that they wanted to know from me. Likewise for professional education, uh, we have six healthcare colleges, but we also have the College of Law. And there are unique uh, opportunities and unique challenges for those colleges as well. So you, you have to spend time doing that. The, the next one was about governance. And Part two of that question, how would you involve all the deans on communication and governance? So th there's sort of two parts to that. One is involving them in uh, communication and, and governance with the provost. And the second is communication and governance with their colleges. And I'll, I'll try to answer both parts of that. So uh, I see the provost and the deans as a team. 
and the provost's job is to help the deans achieve their, their missions. You know, the success of a leader is determined by the success of others. And so you really have to spend your time making sure that they uh, have what they need to be successful. And so it's really a team putting that together uh, for the deans and working with the provost. On the other hand, uh, I'm a big supporter of transparency. And uh, we do a state of the college address every year and I present the budget. Uh, when we had the first draft of the budget model, I went line by line in an open forum to the faculty and staff and even some students attended. And that kind of uh, uh, governance, working with your faculty councils, developing that trust relationship that I'm very fortunate to have, where I can share some very, very confidential things with them and get some feedback on very difficult issues is critical. And so I would uh, constantly encourage them to do that because as scary as it might seem at first, in the end, it's uh, really the best way to operate. And once you build that trust, it really can be a powerful thing to work together. This is my last question, unless there's one in process. You have spoken about transparency and collaboration. What is your plan to help faculty and staff foster trust with each other? With each other. Um, I guess I was expecting the question, trust with the provost, so trust with each other. You know, you've got to create a campus community. And the provost can certainly lead by example in that respect. But you need to uh, help create the environment as well for that. Whether it's with the administration, the leaders in college, uh, we, we all have to set an example of trust and collaboration. And then hopefully that will also trickle down uh, into the faculty. But it's creating that environment where they feel safe. They feel like they can express their views with each other and learn from each other in a very collaborative uh, and integrated way. So it takes um, setting examples, creating opportunities for that to occur, events, other uh, types of things to help uh, for foster that kind of an environment. With no more questions, please take this opportunity to share anything that you would like to add as your closing remarks. Sure, thank you. Well, first, thank you again for spending time this early on, the, at least my car said 19 degree morning. Uh, with us today. It's, uh, I learned a lot from the questions. In fact, I, I told my wife last night when I spoke to her, I said, you know, I think I've, the day was a learning day for me, not just an interview or questioning day, but a learning day. Because the questions I got in all the meetings yesterday were, were very insightful questions. Uh, they were challenging in a good way, made me think about things. And as I, as I said, they help you understand some of the issues that are out there. So it's been a very uh, invigorating process, although about 11 o'clock today, I'll probably be a little tired. Uh, but it's been at least uh, intellectually stimulating and personally invigorating because learning all the incredible things that are going on this campus and uh, the people that really want to make this uh, an even greater place. So I appreciate all of your time. If I'm selected, I promise to, uh, to give it my absolute best to carry out the role of provost and serve uh, all of you, faculty and staff and students. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We have about 12 minutes before the next candidate.
there's too many people I expect you to start with. You know what I mean? I'll, I'll do like I did last time. Two minutes, one, 30 seconds. Two minutes, we're gonna start in two minutes. One minute. Thirty seconds. Ten. Good morning. As we welcome our second candidate to the stage, we'll follow the same f format as we did previously. So please provide your questions on the note cards that are made available, and I will read them as, re as I receive them. Our next candidate, Dean Blackwell, is Professor of Finance and Dean of the Gatton College of Business and Economics at the University of Kentucky. Before joining the University of Kentucky in 2012, he served as the James W. Aston Republic Bank Professor of Finance and Associate Dean for Graduate Programs in Mays Business School at Texas A&M University from 2008 to 2011. Dr. Blackwell served as head of the Department of Finance in Tex at Texas A&M from 2002 to 2008. He earned his PhD in finance in 1986 and his BS in economics in 1981, both from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. From 1998 to 2002, he served as the director of KPMG's forensic practice and in Price Waterhouse Cooper's financial advisory services practice. Dr. Blackwell has a national reputation as a financial scholar and his published works establish his expertise on a broad range of finance related topics, including corporate finance, commercial bank management, executive compensation, and securities underwriting. He has published in, corporation, in, in corporate finance, accounting, and the management of financial institutions, including one of the country's largest leading undergraduate with co-authors Thomas Nolan and Drew Winters was recognized as making the most notable contributions to the auditing literature in 1995 to 2000. By the Journal of Accounting Research for Empirical Work on the Economic Value of Auditing Services. Dr. Blackwell has served as a member of the Board of Directors of Commerce Lexington, Chamber of Commerce, the Washington Campus Inc., a Washington, D.C.-based organization that educates graduate business students on navigating the public policy process. The Southern Finance Association, a regional academic association in finance, and the Twin Cities Endowment, an organization that provides funding for economic development projects in Bryan College Station, Texas area. I give you Dean Blackwell. Test the mic first. We're good. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. Thanks everyone for uh, for being here. I really uh, have been overwhelmed at the the great interest 
and attendance at, at these forums, especially on short notice. So I just I, I thank everyone for for participating. Uh, you know, Robert uh, gave uh, an accounting of, of of my my background. I thought I would just summarize a little bit uh, why I think my experience and background helps helps prepare me for for the provost role here at the University of Kentucky. Uh, then I'd like to talk a little bit just uh, to establish my view of the the model uh, of a university and how how everything fits together, and then that that will lead into a discussion of of the uh, initiatives and the priorities that, that the president has asked each of the candidates to, to address. Uh, I, I guess first and foremost, I'm, I'm a I, I've, I've been a faculty member. Uh, I want to make, make that very clear to everyone. I served as a professor, a faculty member for 13 years. I uh, you know, did all the usual teaching, research, service. Uh, I've taught everything from the very basic principles of finance course all the way up to the PhD seminar. I've chaired seven dissertations, co-authored two textbooks, and uh, developed a, 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 a pretty strong research record in my, in my discipline. And um, I, really, I really enjoyed that experience, learned a lot from it. Um, I, I then had the opportunity to go to industry and, and practice what I had been doing research on and what I had been teaching. And I found that I found that to be uh, uh, very gratifying, and uh, I'll touch a little bit on what I did in those roles because I, I think it bears on some of the immediate tasks uh, facing the provost uh, role here at here at UK. So when 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 I went into consulting, I was really really doing work in two two broad areas. One was uh, valuation, which means that I'm trying to put a, a price or a value for a security you know, a stock, a bond, uh, an option, a company, even intellectual property, such as patents, copyrights, and trademarks. And I did that in a, in a number of contexts, and that's really an application of my economics and finance training. And then uh, on, the other, on the other side, I did a lot of consulting with, with corporate boards uh, on their governance. And basically, that means I'm advising them on uh, how, how to set up incentives in their organizations to achieve the organizational goals. So I'll come back a little bit later to explain why I think those are relevant uh, to, to the provost role today. So after four years in industry, I was, I was then recruited back into higher education. I went you know, very cheerfully and enthusiastically. Um, I, I, I love the industry. I had a great privilege of, of serving at Texas A&M University for 10 years. Uh, I served as a department chair for about five and a half years and nearly five years as associate dean. Uh, while I was associate dean, I was over the graduate programs in, in, the, in the business college there, essentially functioning as the DGS would function here, but also overseeing all of our professional degree programs. So we had a, a wide variety of, of MBA programs and we also had six specialized professional uh, master's degrees. So I. I <coughs> Also, I was, um, I, over, I was overseeing career services uh, in, in that role. Uh, so I, I guess, you know, to, to, to bring it all together, I've, I've seen, you know, I, I was then recruited here to become dean, of course, and I've learned a lot about UK in, in that role. Um, so, you know, starting from an assistant professor, a little break in industry, and then department chair, associate dean, dean. I think I've seen just about everything there is to see uh, in, in the academic landscape, and, and I, I feel very well prepared for, for the provost role. The consulting experience I'll, I'll touch on briefly, because right, right now, a couple of the uh, immediate uh, tasks for the new provost will be to bring closure to the strategic plan, uh, prioritize the, uh, many of the initiatives that are in the existing draft of the strategic plan, and uh, lining, lining up uh, uh, resources along with those priorities. And then uh, the, 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 other, the other job facing uh, the new provost will be to uh, work with the president and, and the executive vice president for finance and administration on determining uh, what form 
uh, the new financial model will take and, and how to get that implemented. And regardless of the form of, of the financial model that, that's implemented, it, it's imperative that the resources uh, in, in that model line up with the university's strategic priorities as outlined in the strategic plan. It's, I think it's important that those two work together. And, and, and it's important that the, the financial model have all of the incentives in place to make sure that the priorities under the strategic plan are, are implemented and, and executed. So I, I, th I think my consulting experience and, and my actual academic background actually provide a good fit for getting those, getting those tasks uh, completed in the, in the short run. Um, I, I guess you know, my vision of, 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 of the university um, is, I, I think, you know, I share with, with, with uh, President Capilouto. I think we've, we're on a path to becoming a residential, uh, a very excellent residential university that has a research foundation. And I, I think that research foundation is critical. It distinguishes, it distinguishes us from, from many, many other universities. I, I, I do believe that a student who graduates from a university that has a strong research emphasis is getting an entirely different and, and yes, I believe better product than if they were attending a university without that research emphasis. So, you know, from undergraduate education to graduate education to research and, and, to, and to outreach and engagement, um, I, I, think, I think the whole, the whole thing works together. Um, if you don't have, if, for example, an excellent uh, doctoral program that's well-funded and well-supported, you're not going to be able to attract world-class faculty who are going to do world-class research. Uh, if you don't have strong and vibrant professional degree programs, you're not, you're not going to serve the, the important mission that we have to the state. And also, those, those programs can, can be, in some instances, a very important source of revenue to the university and to the colleges to support other initiatives. Um, and, and then the undergraduate student benefits from, from all of the above, a vibrant residential experience combined with exposure to, to great research faculty. And I, I, I think it all works together very well. Um, so the, the, I guess to touch on the initiatives that the, that the president has asked me to, to address, I, I, I guess the, uh, he, he wants us to address uh, undergraduate education, graduate education, research, and inclusivity and fairness. Um, I think in undergraduate education, we are uh, under uh, <clears throat> really a, a, an imperative to improve retention from freshman to sophomore year and our graduate six-year graduation rate. Um, even in the last two months, we have, as deans, been very focused on addressing the retention issue. And we've had a, a small working group of, of deans from the uh, colleges with large undergraduate programs working on pretty detailed plans for how to improve retention. Uh, <clears throat> there's really two, two thrusts there. Uh, one is on, on advising, and the other is, is on helping students in those critical courses that, that challenge them uh, the most and that can, can often serve as a roadblock to advancing uh, to the next level in, in their major. The, um, you know, one, one of the, the big elements of, of discussion in, in that context has been, um, what, you know, what are we using the resources that we have most efficiently? And uh, the, that discussion really centers around, you know, what, what things are most efficient and most effective to be handled centrally versus the, the, the things like advising or, or touching students in particular courses are better handled uh, at the college and faculty level. I, th I, think, I think that we've, the president and all of the deans have recognized that for retention to improve, faculty you know, have to buy in and have to support that effort. It can't just be uh, you know, a, a central administrator trying, trying to pull all the strings to make, to make that happen. And so we, we are looking at ways to improve communication between 
the colleges and the uh, <clears throat> central resources that, that are, are there to support student success. As you can imagine, after a day and a half, uh, my voice is struggling, so. Uh, on, on, on graduate education, I, I think the, the, the big issue that's, that's on everyone's mind is if we, as we move to a new financial model, what, what's going to happen to the funding of, of, of doctoral students? There's a lot, of, a lot of funding for doctoral students now that, that, that is uh, distributed centrally. And uh, the, the interim dean of the graduate school, Susan Carvalho, has been working uh, with uh, the co-chairs of the, 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 the graduate education portion of the strategic plan. Uh, I happen to be one of those co-chairs. So Susan has been working very hard over the last couple of months to, to pull together all the data that indicate you know, how much we're spending and, and where it's being spent and what, what are the outcomes from that spending on doctoral education. So it, it, it's somewhat surprising but very difficult to get all of that information together. And we want to make sure we have good, good information as we move into a new financial model and try to wrestle with, you know, whether it's, it's, it's better to have that funding distributed centrally or to, to uh, have the colleges have more um, latitude with how they fund doctoral education. So that's, that's going to be a major issue there. I, th I think the, the, you know, there is some concern about how uh, doctoral students are, are utilized. Um, my, my, my sense, and I don't have the data yet, but my sense is that in some colleges, doctoral students are doing a lot of teaching. And I think the purpose of a doctoral program is to produce scholars and, and teachers but they're, they're not, you know, doctoral students aren't cheap labor. And in fact, I'm not even sure that, that's, that, that using them in that uh, capacity and, and teaching a lot is necessarily the most inexpensive way of, of delivering uh, quality experience to the freshman and sophomore level classes. So that's, that's, that's something I would definitely want to study uh, in, in, or in my role as provost. The... Um, I guess research and creative activity uh, <clears throat> that, you know, there, there's been, a, again, a lot of work already done in the, in the context of the strategic plan on how, how to incentivize uh, and promote research on campus. I, I think that as, as, as provost, I would recognize that one size doesn't fit all with respect to how we, we measure the support for research and how we measure the outcomes of that research and creative activity. So it, it's going to be incumbent on the, on the new provost to, to sit down with each dean and to, and to really get into detail about the nature of, of research and creative work in each of the colleges and how that's funded. Um, you know, so there, there are many disciplines on campus that are important, but yet there aren't a lot of outside sources of, of funding to support that research. And, and so I, I think it's going to be a challenge in the future um, for uh, colleges to, to, to figure out how, how, are, how are they going to support that research. And it may be different with, with each college. And so I, I will uh, you know, do my best as, as provost to help, help the colleges to, to come up with, with a way to support the research function. Um, also, the you know university is is going to be under a lot of you know a lot of pressure to to maintain uh, external funding for research. I mean, it's critical. It's a, it's it's an important part of of uh, you know what what we are supposed to deliver uh, to society. But it's also an important uh, source of revenue for the for the university. And so we we need to incentivize that and promote that. Uh, this is an area uh, where. As provost, uh, I, I would I intend to collaborate, you know, very heavily and very deeply with the vice president for research, and to develop um, develop the appropriate goals that would fit each college's circumstances, and to uh, work out uh, funding mechanisms. I think that that's not that's not something that can be done 
uh, or should be done in a silo. So it'll be very heavy collaboration with, with, the, with the VPR on, on that role. I guess uh, finally, and, and you know, prob probably most importantly, uh, I, I was asked to ad address you know, uh, in inclusivity and, and, and fairness. And let, let, I hope it goes without saying that um, it's, it's essential for, for just moral reasons that we treat each other with dignity and respect, even sometimes when we may not deserve it. We, we, we have to be civil to one another. And uh, I, I would certainly uh, try to promote that on campus if, if, if by no other way through, through, through by ex my example. Um, so get, you know, so I, I do, you know, there's a moral imperative for, 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 for being, uh, treating each other with dignity and respect and everyone. Um, the practical side of it is, is, is critical to our success as a university and to our competitiveness as a university. And, and that is that if you, if you look at the leading public research universities, um, they have much more diverse uh, uh, faculty population and much more diverse student population than we have. Our diversity has been increasing over the last few years, and that's great. Uh, but if you look at the list of our benchmark universities, we're still uh, near the bottom on a number of important metrics. Um, you know, it, it's, it's really a competitive issue uh, in the following sense. If we're going to attract great students and great faculty, uh, we have to be a university that, that prepares the students, in particular, to function in a global society. And without, uh, with, without a diverse campus, that's just not going to be achieved. And, and, and students demand that. They want, they want that experience. They want to be around you know, people from different backgrounds and to learn from them. Um, and, and, and the same goes for attracting faculty here. Uh, if, if we have a, a reputation for treating everyone with dignity and respect and having a welcoming environment, we're gonna be able to, to build on that by, by having an easier time at recruiting and retaining uh, a diverse faculty. And then, you know, on, on, the, on the other end of things with respect to, to students, the practical matter is that employers demand diversity. Uh, they demand diversity in their own workforces, so we need to have a diverse set of graduates to, to, to serve that need. And also, employers recognize that students that graduate from a university where there's greater diversity are gonna have more success in operating in a, in a global environment. So, um, you know, regardless of, of the, the morality, uh, which I believe is important, of, of how we treat each other, um, I think there's, there's a strong uh, a competitive dimension to it that, that we have to address, and, and I, I you know, plan to do everything I can to promote that through uh, incentives to the colleges and through new resources. Uh, to the colleges as they come available. This is another area where the provost cannot operate in a silo. There has to be a much deeper collaboration with the vice president for diversity on developing goals for inclusivity and fairness and diversity on campus. And, and, and I, I intend to work very closely with the VP, uh, the vice president for diversity uh, if, if I'm selected for the, for the job. So, with that, Robert, I will turn it back over to you. First question, UK's average ACT scores are the highest in the state, but lower than regional flagships. Should our average ACT score for incoming freshmen be higher, and if so, how high should it be? Well, it's, it's, no, it's no secret. Or, or, or no mystery that to attract great students to the university, it helps to, help to have a, a set of great students here already. Um, and if you look, you know, in particular, if you look at our benchmarks, we, we are below our benchmarks on the average ACT score. Um, there, there definitely is some correlation between the uh, entering ACT score 
at a university and its retention rate and graduation rate. There's no question about that. Um, so would I, would, I like, would I like to see us have a, a, a higher quality uh, entering class? Absolutely. I'd like to see higher ACT scores and more diversity. Um, and, and uh, you know, I, I think we should recruit hard to attract those students. On the other hand, we, we do have a mission to this state, and we, we have to serve the citizens of this state. And um, that, that may mean that we can't be as selective as, as some other large public universities. It's a, it's a very fine balancing act. Uh, I don't have a, 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 a magic answer to the question of how high it should be, but I, I certainly am, am in favor of recruiting more aggressively to get higher quality students on campus and improve that metric. But I do believe we can't, uh, we can't simply cut off the bottom you know, 20% of our students to achieve that. Two or three years ago, the university started to work on a new budget model with stated goals of transparency and more control at the college level. Today, I hear a great deal of uncertainty about future budgeting directions absent of transparency. What are your ideas for steps to take to resolve uncertainty and achieve our goals? Well, you know, um, one, I'll, I'll, I, I will say that I'm in favor of, you know, moving to some sort of new model for allocating resources that has the resources follow the need. Meaning, you know, if, you know, if, if we have students, you know, moving to one academic unit or another, there need to be some resources flowing in that direction to support, um, support those students. Um, I, I actually like the idea of, of moving to a, an RCM type of, type of model. I think it does promote transparency, and uh, I think it, it does provide a very natural incentive for academic units to be creative and innovative. You know, there's, there's some downsides to it, for sure, uh, but, but there are a lot of great universities that, that have adopted such a model, and, and, and they're thriving, and I think there are um, you know, lots of excellent examples that we can draw from to make sure that we have a, a great system for allocating resources. Um, this is not an issue that the provost gets to tackle alone or make the decision on alone. It, it's really a discussion that at, at first uh, has to take place with the president and the executive vice president for finance and administration. And then once, once a decision is made, um, the, the, the model would need to be again, exposed again to all of the deans to get to get their buy-in and, to, and to, to make improvements as needed. And, and then I think there has to be a broad effort at educating the entire campus about how the model works. Um, and, and one element that, that probably needs a, more, a bit more um, detail to it is, is how, uh, you know, how um, uh, I guess, modifications to the model might take place over time and how budgets for the non, the, the units that aren't generating revenue, how those are determined over time. And there, there again, there are really good examples of mechanisms in place that involve um, all the constituencies on campus in giving input in, into those kinds of decisions. So I think the first step is, is just for the, the, the top leadership team to decide, and hopefully very quickly, decide how, how to move forward and uh, once that decision is made, I think we communicate it and, and, and move ahead toward implementation. Um, but, I, but I hope we resolve that very, very quickly. When considering the importance of enhancing soft skills for graduate and professional students, what is your vision for integrating such initiatives into curricular or extracurricular programs? How would you convince graduate faculty to uh, embrace such initiatives? Well, this, this, is, a, this, is, a, this is a tough challenge. 30% um, of our doctoral students that graduate actually don't go into the academic world. They, they go into other, other positions, perhaps in industry, nonprofits, perhaps government. I, I think, you know, our faculty, by their nature, our uh, desire to kind of produce students that are in their own image, that are scholars. 
And the reality uh, in the job market for a lot of disciplines is that there just aren't enough, there just aren't enough good jobs uh, for, for PhDs. And that's why a lot of them do end up going into, into industry and, and other, other venues. Uh, so I guess, I guess there's two, you know, two ways to approach this. One is to, you know, just to be more selective in, in uh, doctoral admissions and trying, thinking about concentrating resources to attract the very best students so that when they graduate, they have a better chance of placing in an academic job if that's what they want. But I think we also have to recognize that some students come to a doctoral program because they want to go to industry or they want to go to government or a nonprofit. And, and regardless of whether you know, the, the decision to do that is, is based on a career plan or just necessity, I think we're obligated to support uh, those students. Um, the typical doctoral program doesn't have built into it uh, a, a professional component, if you will, in terms of soft skills. And that's, that's, a, that's a trend that's emerging around the country at, at, at really top universities is to have some, some sort of career services for, uh, for doctoral students who are, you know, from, who are going into any of the realms, frankly. Uh, they can all benefit from having the soft skills. Um, so I, I, believe, I believe that's necessary. I don't have a specific uh, plan in mind for how we, how we implement that here. But it certainly would help if, if the faculty that are supervising students would, would buy in and, and be willing to contribute to that effort. Should the university have a foreign language requirement? I don't know. <laughs> Um, I, I think at a university this large, that would be an impractical requirement. But I, I think it's a, great, it's a great idea, and if it's appropriate for, for certain majors to implement that, I'd certainly be supportive of it. How would you address the challenge facing living learning programs in regards to student access? These halls cost significantly more than the old residential halls, plus there is discussion about adding an additional fee for students to be a part of a living learning program. How will you work to keep these halls accessible to all? Well, the, you know, I, I think the, the LL, the living learning programs, the LLPs, are just one uh, essential piece of the, the, the effort on, on retention and timely, timely graduation. Um, I, as, as provost, I would advocate, number one, let's, let's study the LLPs and how they're functioning so far and see if they're really, if they're really having an impact. Um, or, are they helping to move the needle on retention or not? Uh, number two, to, to find out whether these LLPs are actually helping us to attract uh, more, more great students. Uh, and then, and then Three, uh, if we're going to, to continue to promote L LLPs and to grow them, uh, there, there is this question of, of access. You know, if you think about retention, um, the, the students that have trouble from freshman to, to sophomore year are typically students that, that are perhaps underprepared or financially challenged. And um, <clears throat> what, at least this is anecdotal, I don't, I don't have all of the data, but when I look at the, the Gatton College's LLP and I go and, and meet with those students, what I see is a, is a group of highly talented, motivated students that have time to be deeply involved in the university. And that means they're probably not out working 30 hours a week to, to make ends meet. So it, it's, it's, it, it's rather ironic that we're trying to use LLPs to help retention, but when you look at the students that are in the LLPs, they may not necessarily be the students that need the most help um, so that's, that's a dimension, I think, that, that requires study. Having a fee, um, you know, that, I don't know if a decision has been made on, the, on that fee or not. Not sure where that is. Um, and I have not been privy to those discussions. But certainly adding another fee at this time seems to be inconsistent with, you know, keeping uh, up with affordability and access, in particular for the students that would benefit most from the LLPs who are, you know, 
typically financially disadvantaged. So if there is a, if there is a fee, I, I would advocate that you know, some portion of that be set aside for need-based scholarships for, for students that we need to get into the LLP. What is your opinion on the balance of need-based versus merit-based aid? Uh, we need more of both, um, and you know, on on the on the need based side, I I think that it's you know one, it's imperative for um, to maintain the university's accessibility that we have more need need based aid uh, as as state funding uh, either erodes or or stays flat, and as other resources such as external research funding from the federal government, either stay flat or erode, we're, we're gonna continue to have challenges to, to keep tuition affordable. So need-based need -based scholarships will be essential for us to, to effectively meet our mission and that also has the impact, I, I believe, will have the impact of uh, improving retention if we have more need-based uh, scholarship. Uh, on the other hand, I, I think that we, we improve the, the competitiveness and the national profile of the university with more, uh, with more merit-based aid. And, and so I, I think there has to be a balance of both uh, for us to advance. Um, I, you know, the university is considering moving into a new capital campaign. Uh, from my perspective, a, a, a big thrust of that campaign I think needs to be around scholarships and um, you know right now we're, we're funding scholarships just from our you know our operating revenue essentially and I, I think that if we can get our, our, our alumni and friends on board with really building our scholarship endowment it'll it'll help those students but also free up uh, resources at the university level to invest in more instructors and advisors and things that will improve the academic experience and improve retention and graduation rates Regarding diversity and inclusivity, please address how you would create a more inclusive environment on campus for students, staff, and faculty. So I, I guess probably first and foremost, I will try to lead by example in terms of how I interact with all of the constituencies on campus. Um, I, I pride myself on treating my colleagues with, with dignity and respect. Um, I happen to, to, to be one that, you know, I, I get very close to the, the people that I work with every day and, and end up genuinely caring about them. Um, I, I would like to promote that kind of spirit of leadership all over campus. Uh, there's unfortunately not a magic wand that I know of in the provost's office that, you know, one can wave and make this happen. So just, just like many other initiatives on campus, I think that there need, needs to be one, uh, a strategic imperative. Uh, in other words, it's in the strategic plan. And, and two, that there are incentives for academic units to meet that strategic imperative. And, and three, that there's accountability for it. So, um, you know, as I said earlier in my introductory remarks, you know, Inclusivity is essential if we're going to attract and retain uh, great faculty members and great students uh, from diverse backgrounds. Um, so as, uh, as provost, I would work very closely with the vice president of diversity, uh, develop a plan that lines up with the, the university's strategic plan, and then create the incentives and provide some resources for the deans to make it happen. Not, you know, there's not much of anything on campus that doesn't happen without the involvement of the deans, department chairs, and ultimately, you know, the faculty and staff. So there has to be some incentives, some resources to support, and then accountability after the fact. If you are selected as provost, will you be resigning as dean? Uh, I can't serve in both roles at the same time, so. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I don't know if I would be resigning as dean. I would just would be reassigned, and then we would engage in a in a process to find a replacement for dean of the Gatton College. 
How do you envision addressing the classroom crisis enhanced by the loss of the student center rooms during construction and our growing entering classes? I, I don't have an answer for that one. That's a, uh, a short term issue. Um, and I don't have the, I don't, I really don't have information uh, uh, to really help me address it. I, I agree it's, it's critical. Um, we're growing, we're running out of classroom space. We've got the student center issue on one hand. Uh, on the other hand, we've got the Gatton College under construction and we've lost a lot of classroom capacity that was being used by units all over campus in, in that instance. I, I think that all, all the provosts can really do in the short term is to try to change the culture um, because, I, you know, it's amazing that the most effective teaching and learning goes on between 10 in the morning and 2 in the afternoon on Tuesday and Thursday. You know, that, that, is, that is the optimal time. Uh, so I think we're going to have to get creative about using other parts of the clock uh, to help us meet our mission. And that's, in the short run, I think all a provost can, can do. What do you see as the future of graduate students, not just as learners, but as teachers of undergraduates? And what should their role be in undergraduate education? So I, I assume the question is referring primarily to the doctoral students. Um, and again, my, my view of doctoral programs is, is that they're primarily there to train uh, scholars. And, 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 and to me, a scholar is a researcher and a teacher. Uh, but tip, typically, the most challenging element of, of a career in academics is, is the research element. And uh, to get really solid placements for doctoral students, I think that they need to spend a lot of time while they're on campus engaged in, in research. If, if, they're, you know, if their teaching demands are too high, they're just, they just simply don't have time that they need to devote to research. And, for those that try to, you know, try to burn the candle at both ends, and uh, you know, be excellent at both, uh, I think they may end up not being, you know, very good at either, and that could cause them to take much longer to graduate than than they should. Uh, I think the right amount of teaching um, for a, a graduate student is probably the the minimum required to establish their credibility in in the job market, um, and and so they're. they're you know, they have to have some teaching experience to be credible in the job market. What types of teaching should they do? I mean, I, I certainly think that uh, having them engage at, at the, uh, you know, the introductory level is, is fine. I think in certain instances, having them even teach in the upper division is fine. It doesn't necessarily have to be just a, a recitation section or, um, you know, or, or something you know, some kind of extra um, uh, out of, you know, out of the norm sort of, of teaching. I, I think that they need to have a, a you know, a serious uh, classroom experience to be credible in the market. Explain your thoughts on the importance of undergraduate transfer students on our campus. What specific ideas do you have to increase the success of these transfer students? Um, you know, w one, I think, I think transfer students are, or an opportunity, um, and you know, candidly, we might we might serve ourselves well by by encouraging some of the students that come here as freshmen to perhaps consider starting at a community college and then transferring here. Um, you know, especially you know if, if there's an indication that that a student is going to have trouble transitioning to life on a on a big campus and, and far away from home. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I think that actually can make some sense and perhaps we maybe start working with some of the community colleges to, 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 to kind of build a, a pipeline that would have students come to campus better prepared, which means they're more likely to succeed. Um, so I, I, you know, I, th I think transfer students are, are uh, an, an important, an important element of, of, of our service to the state. And I think they have an opportunity to help, help us improve on 
retention and graduation rates. Will you please comment on fairness in faculty reviews and appeals and fostering faculty development? There, I, I, I would imagine there's a lot of uh, variation on campus in terms of how faculty are, are evaluated. Um, I, I would like to see it tightened up. Um, I think we need to be consistent, but certainly uh, the, the consistency can't be at the expense of, of elements of the review process that are discipline specific. Um, I, I think it's important that faculty get reviewed regularly. Um, as, you know, and actually I, I've you know, been here three years, I find it odd that we don't evaluate faculty every year. We do it every two years. Um, you know, that, that's, you know, that's something that, that's in place, but I, I, you know, I question whether, whether that, that really is, is a good practice. Um, the, I've been, been a part, actually, of, a, of an appeal process. It seems to me to be working fairly well, but uh, certainly I would sit down with uh, the, the associate provost for faculty advancement to make sure that, that it is functioning well. Um, and I think faculty development is critical, especially for getting tenure track faculty progressing properly towards tenure. So uh, I, I, I think we have to continue to make efforts to help those faculty members. Uh, I think we also have a challenge on the other end as faculty members you know, move later in their career and their, their interests and, and skills perhaps change, we perhaps need to find ways to uh, make sure that those faculty are getting uh, the, the, the skills and background that they need to, to continue uh, contributing. With the movement towards responsibility-based budgeting, it appears there has been a proliferation of programs at the graduate and undergraduate level as a way to generate more tuition dollars. What are your thoughts on how this will impact resources within the colleges as well as the student experience, advising, and time to degree? So I, <clears throat> I'm not fully aware of all of the new, the new programs that are, that are under consideration, but I, I, I know there's, there's a, a, a group of programs that are uh, professional master's programs that are based on a market, uh, a market tuition, uh, and some of those programs are designed to be online. Uh, those, you know, those should shouldn't, if if they're designed properly and staffed properly, they shouldn't uh, tax the capacity of the uh, of the unit in the long run. They might they might tax the capacity of the unit in the short run, uh, just just because it takes a while to get a program up and running in equilibrium. Ideally, those programs would pay for themselves, and even more ideally, and I mean, I mean fully costed, you know, down, down to, the, you know, to the faculty time and to the paper clips and you name it. Even more ideally, those programs would generate revenue in excess of what it costs to deliver them so that um, un under the under the, uh, an RCM type of model, the, uh, the, the, the deans and department chairs could, and, the, and the program directors can forecast out what uh, demand is likely to be in the future and then make a decision about whether that stream of revenue can support hiring additional faculty or not. I mean, that's, that's the kind of thinking that, that, that deans are gonna have to, to um, start using under this kind of model is they've, they've really got to think like a business, look ahead and then determine when the revenue stream is sustainable, do I hire faculty and then what kind of faculty do I hire? Uh, so th so these, these types of programs should not tax the capacity to deliver other dimensions in the unit except probably in the very early part of, of, a, of the program. How will you address the perceived but also real division of interest between the medical and non-medical sides of campus? 
Um, I'm, you know, I, I, I just, one thing I've been learning from this process is I'm not sure it's useful for us to continue uh, discussing our university as if there's two campuses. Um, we're, one, we're one university, and I know that there, there are vast differences in how, uh, how the medic, medical school operates and how other, other units operate, or how the you know, dentistry college or pharmacy college operates and, and, and other, other uh, units on campus. But these are essentially professional schools. Uh, they, they require that the students practice what they're going to do under close supervision. And it is just a different model of instruction and a different type of research. I, I, I think there are you know, some complexities that I've just you know, been learning about through this process of, of you know, how clinical faculty are treated relative uh, you know, to you know, a more traditional uh, faculty model, and you know, I'm I'm certainly you know willing to, to roll up my sleeves and collaborate uh, with with the healthcare colleges to determine how to best uh, um, manage those faculty and, and help them advance in their careers. Um, but I'd, I'd like I'd like for us to end the dialogue of you know this side of campus versus that side of campus. I just don't find that's useful. We need to collaborate. The two provost candidates come from fundamentally different academic backgrounds. With UK as one university, the provost has to wear academic leadership hats on both the undergraduate and academic health care aspects of UK. How as provost would you approach understanding the knowledge, beliefs, behaviors of each constituency to lead the university? Well, I, <clears throat> I'll, I'll reflect a little bit on my consulting experience here because it it is somewhat relevant. Um, when, when you, you know, when an analyst undertakes to find what a company is worth, you know, what should the stock price be, you have to, you have to pull that company apart, understand, you know, the elements of the marketplace that affect that company, the supply and demand, the cost, the regulation, and, and how, you know, how the business model works. I've, I've done that for so many different companies and so many industries, um, I, I can't even begin to count them or to, to tell you, from, from tech, high technology to energy, even, even healthcare. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna rely on those skills to help me learn and understand um, the, how UK healthcare operates uh, so that I understand the challenges that uh, those the leaders, the academic leaders in, in those settings uh, have to face. Uh, so that's, you know, th that's, that's one approach. And two, I, I, I feel like um, as, as provost, I need to have a presence on the entire campus, not, not just in the main building. So um, I, I look forward to collaborating with, with, the, with the healthcare deans and the leadership of UK Healthcare so that we can we can work together and, and, and achieve all the goals of the university. Uh, collaboration and communication, I think, will uh, enable that, and I'm you know, very willing to listen and learn. UK's status as a land-grant university is a barrier to becoming academically competitive with schools like Virginia, Michigan, and UNC, and Texas A&M. Please make a comment. I'm, I'm just speculating about who sent that in. <laughs> Sorry. Um, you know, the, the <clears throat> how many of you know that Cornell University in the Ivy League is a land-grant university? Okay. Um, now, there's, there's, there's a connotation around land-grant that is, that somehow it's, it's, it's low level. And I just don't agree with that. Um, I think what it really means is that we're supposed to be more applied, and that's absolutely fine uh, as a as a uh, a competitive and strategic niche for a university to be to be applied. Is 
is promoting that uh, part of our, our heritage and our mission? Is that useful to uh, our image in, in the country? Is it useful in attracting faculty or staff? Or does it hurt that? I, I, don't, think it, I don't think it either detracts or, or helps. Uh, I think it's pretty neutral. There's a lot of land-grant universities. We all have similar missions. And many of them are excellent, and I think we're one of them that are excellent. And I, I don't think that designation in and of itself holds us back. This is my last question, unless there's one in process. How would you gauge UK's progress in the areas of diversity? One, in student recruitment at all levels, and two, faculty and staff. How would, I missed the first part. How would you gauge UK's progress in the areas okay. of diversity? How would I gauge the progress? Um, <clears throat> I mean, there, there, are, there are fairly standard uh, metrics uh, out there that, 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 show, that show our progress um, in terms of the, the number and the proportion of faculty and students from, from, various, from various groups. I mean, those, those are fairly standardized. Perhaps, and I, and I don't know to what extent the university is doing this, uh, but perhaps an another step uh, that we could do is to, to, to really survey our, our students, survey our faculty and staff uh, to find out, you know, what, you know, what the climate is really like and perhaps uh, develop uh, some kind of measure of, 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 of the climate on the university and see how we're tracking that over time. I think that, that's, a, that's a broader, that's perhaps broader, but I think it's essential to diversity, so a lot of companies do this, um, you know, and, and a lot of it gets a lot of press because uh, of these, um, uh, you know, there's one nationwide, and then each state, and Kentucky does this as well, has a survey on the best places to work, um, and those those get a lot of press for those companies, and I think uh, that they they use survey techniques to determine what the climate is, and I think having that data could help us to diagnose. Uh, issues and, and whether we're improving over time or not. And that would be in addition to just the standard uh, metrics of, you know, proportion of women and African Americans, et cetera. With no more questions, please take this opportunity to give any, provide any, us any closing remarks. Um, I guess thank you so much for being here. Thanks for the questions. And I'll, I just want to say I'm very honored to be considered for this role. Um, I, I think I can be a big help to the university, but you know we're in a great we're in a great situation. No matter what, what no matter whether I'm selected or not, I'm still at UK, uh, and 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 and, and I'm going to contribute the best I can to the Gatton College and to UK. If I'm not selected, and if I am selected, uh, I'm going to work extremely hard uh, to to help us get on track to excellence. And thank you all for for being here and for supporting this effort. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you.